and I am going to go ahead and start to record as well. So I will ask that anybody um, that doesn't already have their uh, video off, uh, if you could turn that off for me, that would be wonderful. Okay. So we are going to uh, be, we have a, an extensive panel today and we have a limited amount of time. So I will introduce those, uh, welcome each panelist and then reserve their bi uh, biographical information to just before their portion of the presentation today. Um, so we're going to welcome everyone. Uh, first off, we do have Hope. Hope Ascara is the registrar um, at the Torrance Art Museum. And joining Hope are uh, Marina Figueredo and Nicholas Alonso from the Sage Culture Gallery in Los Angeles. Marina and Nicholas represent artist Domingos Tortora, whose, Tortora, whose work we will be discussing today. And we'd also like to welcome artist Jack Henry, as well as Adam Moskowitz from the Moskowitz Bay, from Moskowitz Bay's Gallery in Los Angeles, who represent artist Kylie White. Unfortunately, Kylie wasn't feeling well, so she's not going to be able to join us today, but we do wish her a speedy recovery. Um, as I said, I'll be sure to include a link to all of their websites in the chat, as well as a link to the TAM show so that you'll all get a chance to take a look at it. Um, to start us off, Marina and Nicholas will discuss the work of Domingos, but first a little bit about all of them. <clears throat> Marina Figueredo and Nicholas Alonso are the creative duo behind Sage Culture, an art gallery based in Los Angeles. Originally from Brazil, they've been working within the creative industry for over 15 years, providing strategic services and directing advertising campaigns and films for clients worldwide through their former agency, Creative Supply Network. In 2013, the couple was deeply inspired by a visit to Easter Island where they could experience art in its most primitive form. As a concept, Sage Culture was then born from a desire to unify their creative skills and the universe of the arts and culture. After moving to London in 2016, their initial idea evolved when they had the opportunity to absorb the city's vibrant cultural scene and complement their studies in management, business design, photography, and filmmaking at the University of the Arts. Founded in 2017, Sage Culture comprises art exhibitions and a diverse range of projects within the arts and culture sector. <clears throat> the gallery represents artists whose deep connection to nature serves as their primary source of inspiration. By using natural materials or promoting discussions on the subject, they contribute to reimagining this crucial but endangered bond with Earth. The result is a constant attempt to artistically portray the relationship between people and nature from absorbing, observing humanity's primordial cultures and its complete integration with the environment to the contemporary efforts to make sense of this relationship today. Now a little bit about the artist, Domingos Totora. Born and raised in Maria de Fe, a city in the mountainous regions, region of Minas Gerais, Brazil, Domingos Totora chose cardboard as the source material for his work. In his studio, recycled cardboard is broken up into small pieces and turned into a pulp, which serves as the base for his art pieces. Besides the environmental impact where the whole community is involved in collecting cardboard to be recycled, there is also a social component to his work. A network was formed and benefits directly and indirectly from the artist in the small town in Brazil's countryside. The beauty of his work not only manifests in the final product, but also in the process itself. From the philosophy, from, excuse me, uh, the beauty of his work not only manifests in the final product, but in the process itself. From the artist's philosophy and respect for the environment to his production process, everything translates to Domingos' sensitivity, awareness, and deep connection to his roots. 
Objects and environment make it clear that this isn't an obsessive search for, for perfection. Imperfection is a constitutive part of Domingos's work. In the artist's words, I dialogue with the mass of cardboard until the moment that only it speaks. Then I let myself take over until I finish the piece. I do not just design, I look for the emotion before even the function. Hope. Thank you, that was lovely. So when I first was starting to create the idea for rewilding structures, it was actually Tapia by Domingos that kind of was the catalyst for the idea. Well, the catalyst was already there, but the, the aesthetic catalyst of the show was Domingos Tapia when I saw this work that not only was visually very true to this aesthetic and this idea of the Anthropocene, but also when he was in his practice, very true to the Anthropocene. Can you guys tell the everyone or the guest about Domingo's process? Because I think it's so interesting, like how he creates his work that it, it looks like earth, but it's cardboard and he takes his cardboard and make transforms it. Yeah, sure. We, first of all, thank you for inviting us to be part of the panel. It's a pleasure to speak about. Thank Domingo. you for being here. Yeah, so uh, Domingos, uh, for those who are not familiar, he's a Brazilian uh, artist in design and he uh, is based in a very small town in Brazil, in Minas Gerais state on, on the countryside. So it's like um, now there's like 14,000 people living there. Uh, and he uh, actually started working with cardboard a long time ago. Uh, I think over 25 years ago, he started uh, experimenting with this material. So at the time, like sustainability or like uh, was not very much in focus as right now. So he, he doesn't like to be labeled as a sustainable or like artist or like his practice being focused on that. But this is part of his work uh, very much for sure, because he he noticed like back then, uh, 30, 30 years ago, that already like there were many cardboard boxes being discarded in this village. And he was involved in like uh, art teaching in the community. And he started using the cardboard as like um, material for this uh, cooperative that he was like at the time starting. So uh, as, as like a teacher at the time. So then he started like experimenting with the material and like the whole, it, it, with time, the whole community started to be involved, like collecting the cardboard to like bring to his workshop and studio that was like kind of like an evolution of the process. But he very much was like into this material that he found that was like very, um, uh, how can I say raw and and was very connected to to the place itself and was very like, you know, the the raw matter and how he because he's a very he's very connected to the to the place itself to the land and the city. And we have like some images. I think it's good. Yeah. Maybe we can share so you guys can see like his studio and he himself and everything else. Can you see this uh, our screen? Yeah, uh, I would like to point out that uh, Tapia is up in the right hand corner, the striations of the earth. Yes. I, I'm sure he's it's a representation of somewhere near him but it really reminds me a lot of the striations in the earth in Palos Verdes for any of you that are Southern California residents. So mm -hmm. that caught my eye and made me think of the geological sediment there. Yeah, so he's very inspired by the region. You can see like, there's like a tiny photo showing like the mountain. So it's a mountain region uh, and it's very uh, beautiful. It's a beautiful place. His studio is actually surrounded by a uh, native uh, forest in Brazil that is like preserved. So you cannot build anything. So it's like, in a, it's very, very beautiful. You can only see like the forest and 
and then he built like a studio where he works and live. He lives in the same in the same place where he works. And like with the time that I was saying about the material, he started testing. Um, and he the way he works is that he collects the cardboard with the help of the whole community, and then he kind of just removes the labels and but nothing is like done. It's the raw cardboard that he kind of like uh, soaked into water. And then he transformed this, this into a pulp, uh, like shredding it and then uh, pressing the water excess. It's a very similar technique to a paper mache, but with time he managed to find this formula where um, it became more resistant. So it's very, if you see in person, like he also creates functional pieces. He, he was very, he is very well known in Brazil for his design objects, like um, chairs, tables, and all these like benches, and they are all functional. So it's very, it's very resistant. It looks like, feels like wood and looks like wood. So he says that it's kind of a way that he found to bring the cardboard back into wood again, into wood properties again. So it's not only like sustainable, but it's a product, it's like a piece, art piece or like that lasts like for a long time. It's not like fragile. So he he started like experimenting and developed this technique through, through the years. Um, and then like right now he works in a studio with the help of uh, around 10 uh, assistants so and and he like helped also to bring Maria da Fé his city his hometown to like the spotlight not only in Brazil but like in Europe or even here in the United States we're doing like this uh, work with him to like bring his work here and he um, in the end the whole community was like benefited and then of his work and of the practice and and yes yeah, so he works with natural pigments as we were saying hope was saying about the piece the type of piece which is this wall uh big wall piece that you can see in the screen so everything is like made with this pulp and like hand molded and then it dries in the sunlight and also uh the pigments that you see like you can see in a photo the red pigment it's a uh, pigment from the earth in brazil the earth um it has this exact color, it's very red. So it's kind of like a future uh, pigment from the earth that they use to like, uh, to make this color. And also he uses graphite to like, uh, if you see on his portrait on the other side, you can see black pieces. So it's also a uh, natural dye with graphite pigments. Uh, and I think uh, that's it what about the process. I don't know if you want to help me. Yeah, that's something it. else <laughs> so what i really love about his work is that to me it's almost like deifying nature that uh, elevating nature to this sort of to art and to and not that it's not art but a lot of people like you see nature and you're like oh it's pretty but diego he is creating this level of where nature is art and art is nature. Uh, what about his work drew you guys to it? Sorry? What what drew you to his work? What yeah for me it yeah creates so nature and mm -hmm. well, the, exactly this that you just mentioned I think because it's a uh, it's kind of like a, it's not a portrait of the of the land and of not exactly a portrait but it's uh it brings the essence of the place and in a way that uh, Domingos, he, he doesn't like when people say, oh, your, your bench, it looks like a rock or something like that, because <laughs> it, it doesn't think that it's like imitating, but it's kind of like, a, it's kind of like a portraying, yeah, portraying surroundings. yeah, it's a love letter, I think, to the city because he's very, Absolutely. very much involved and, and attached to, to the city and to the landscape in a way that we never seen before. If you like, if you're, if you are with him a day uh, around there, you can see like he almost speaks with the, you know, 
the mountain and he knows everything like the lighting or the time or even the city because it's a very old town so you see uh this abandoned uh, mm. farms or all very old places that it's almost like uh falling everything up so it's almost like falling apart but it's it's and he was the first to see the beauty of those of those things and the old uh benches are like the the wall that it's kind of like he 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 can see uh beyond like the appearance of things he he sees like the essence and and the history behind it and that's what that was what uh, brought our, our attention to his work uh, not only it's beautiful but it's just like so uh sublime and, and like um yeah mm -hmm. Absolutely. I 100% agree with you. And I guess uh, you kind of already answered it for me, but uh, does Domingos like to be considered an environmentalist artist or that's he's trying to stay away from that sort of denomination? And I think, um, you know, like uh, he's very inspired by, by his own history and surroundings. So it's not in his mindset, you know, like being um, a sustainable artist, uh, first of all, but he's aware of his work. And so we, he's more committed to uh, using uh, uh, repurposing cardboard because his, his work is very unique because he only uses cardboard as his main source. It's different from, you know, like let's say Frank Gehry that uses uh, cardboard for like functional pieces or even like Sterling, Sterling Ruby that has uh, multi, um, um, multimedia works, including cardboard in some pieces, but Domingos just uses the raw uh, repurposed cardboard uh, and just two pigments uh, for more than 25 years. So I think the outcome of his inspiration is very global. I'm, you know, like, because it's very, um, as you said, has some stratas of uh, ge ge geological um, um, eras, let's say, on, in the type of work, or uh, he's has this kind of like very natural textures like rocks or um, uh, more like organic uh, shapes. Mm -hmm. And it's very abstract. So everything that we are saying here is not the first perception, right? From someone that is not um, used to his uh, inspiration, but he uses like, um, you know, even like working with, uh, let's say, uh, this earth, this clay is something that was, you know, he's 60 years old. So when he was very young, like a child, he used to use uh, clay to build, um, let's say, walls, because Brazil has this kind of like a homes that is using like bamboos and clay. So you, you do this very like uh, uh, antique, let's say, um, ancient technique. Ancient technique. So he mixed a lot of different uh, influences in his life, surroundings, surrounding nature. And also he has like an incredible um, artistic knowledge about the contemporary art world. So he, uh, by, you know, uh, naturally he created his own language. Mm -hmm. uh, and then it's very clear, it's very easy to perceive every single artwork that he designed or developed or even like the functional pieces that he started. So this is something that he's, he's aware about the environmental situation, but for him is more, is, is a little bit more than that, you know, mm -hmm. contributing for that is, is key, but it's a, it's a kind of expression using a very common material. So it's, okay. it's, it's not a, like a, like an activism, mm -hmm. but it's more like an artistic, unfolding let's say but in the end his work is very sustainable because it's like a hundred percent clean process he only uses like cardboard at his meat media and the work is not like uh, disposable and, and in the end it's also yeah. inclusive for example economically in this in the yeah. region and and it also has like a social impact so you cannot like deny that it's a so sustainable yeah. work but he just doesn't like to be this comes for this he doesn't like this to come first or like as a label or something yeah or and something. even like being a pioneer in this kind of process at least in brazil um 
wasn't something that created that for that purpose, right? So, but he's very aware and um, uh, even like being like an, in a studio that has uh, this uh, uh, kind of like um, uh, unique language, uh, but uh, is important in our side as a, a gallerist, let's say, to promote his work uh, here in the United States, also helping him in promoting his work in Europe with like very important galleries over there, or even like with the uh, Torrance Art Museum, right? Like doing uh, our goal is to show how this um, artist can create awareness through the material and then people can understand his um, uh, influences later on, right? Like mm -hmm. through their, their, the, the, the exhibitions that they develop or even like the subjects about the, the scene in Torrance Art Museum. So it's something that um, connects us by itself, I think. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you so much. I really appreciate learning a little bit more about Domingos. I like it. It kind of made me think about uh, Ai Weiwei and how he has little towns that also like are building and creating his work. And it's also very social, it has a very social aspect to it and social conscience. Thank you for talking with me today, you guys. I really appreciate it. Thank Always you. a pleasure. Thank you for sharing Domingo's work with us. Thank you. Think so. up Thank you so much. That was really, really informative. And we're really happy to have the both of you here today. That worked out wonderfully. Um, we're going to go ahead and invite Jack to um, join us now. I think, yeah, I was going to say what I'm going to do is, OK, you're unmuted, correct? Yes. OK, so I am going to pin you if I can see, and uh, give you a brief little introduction. Jack Henry is a, a sculptor and installation artist from Flint, Michigan, who has worked professionally in New York City for 10 years. Jack has exhibited his work throughout the US and abroad, including exhibitions at Wasserman Projects Detroit, Leslie Heller Workspace, workspace in New York, Project Traum in Friedrichshafen, Germany, Black and White Gallery in Brooklyn, and Fjord Gallery in Philadelphia. He has received fellowships from institutions including the Art Fitz Foundation in Dorado, Puerto Rico, and the Banff Center in Alberta, Canada. His work has been written about in the Chicago Tribune, the L Magazine, and Hyperallergic. Jack Henry lives and works in Brooklyn, New York. Welcome, Jack. Thank you for having me. Hi, Jack. Thank you for joining us today. And thank you for sharing your work with Torrance Art Museum. That's so you have a very, thanks. You have a very, very unique language and style and vision. How long did it take you to develop that sort of because you see your work and you're like, that's Jack's work. Like there's mm -hmm. like, I'll see like pictures pop up on like hypoallergenic and doesn't even like say your name. I'm like, oh, Jack, <laughs> how do you develop but, your style? Uh, well, like with anything, it uh, develops over a long period of time. Um, I'll do a share screen and kind of uh, oh, explain my inspiration. Um, let's see. So uh, as is mentioned in my bio, I'm originally from Flint, Michigan. Uh, this image uh, is one of my favorite buildings in Flint, which was recently torn down. Um, but it's indicative of what the landscape is there. Um, you know, it's a former General Motors automotive industry town uh, where that industry is left. So uh, the landscape of Flint is full of these empty buildings and empty parking lots um, and kind of all of the discarded objects that come with that. So in my early work and even my work today, it's heavily influenced by this landscape. Um, in fact, like my first like uh, thesis that I did for school was uh, collecting all these objects that I would find in empty lots, uh, assemble them into sculptures, photograph them and leave them. 
kind of like an urban Andy Goldsworthy type thing. Um, oh, I dig it. Yeah. So what I became really interested in is sort of like, what is the evidence that is left by um, when an industry leaves or when people leave? Um, there's a lot of abandoned houses as well. And uh, I became really interested in our discarded objects, the things that get left behind. Um, and that's still become, that's still like a big part of my work. Um, but in the, in the early, uh, early pieces that I was making, I would take all of these objects that I'd collect from the roadside or from empty lots and take a bit more of an archeological approach rather than an ecological approach. I'd, uh, assemble them all into a mold, uh, and pour, uh, cement or resin over them to make them look like layers of the earth with all of our discarded objects and plants and that sort of thing in them. Um, and here's another example. Most of these things are collected from the street um, around my studio in Brooklyn. And though I was thinking about it as sort of this archaeological thing, you know, thinking about where I was from, this sort of post-industrial landscape, it was impossible to deal with landscape that way and it not eventually become kind of an ecological themed uh, pursuit, practice. Um, and as I was making these things, more and more plant life uh, entered the work, um, which you can see here uh, in this detail, there's you know, some, some plants that start to enter uh, along with the tarp and other found art objects. Um, but, you know, thinking about objects in the landscape, you know, there, there is the, on the one hand, it's what we can see, but on the other hand, you know, our uh, intervention into uh, the environment, into the landscape has permeated beyond what we can see. Obviously there's microplastics in the soil uh, and the water and even conceptually, you know, what we would consider to be true wilderness is something that only exists in natural parks and protected land. So, you know, we, we still sort of inherently are saying that we have control over those spaces. So I started taking uh, plant life and uh, embedding them within gypsum cement uh, in replace of uh, what used to be primarily like found objects. Um, and this is from uh, an installation I did two years ago in Miami, where uh, I grew grass on the interior of the space. Each one of the artists that participated in this got to take over a uh, space inside of an abandoned strip mall, uh, and we could do whatever oh, we wanted. Cool. Yeah. So I, I was just thinking a lot about uh, the ecology of South Florida and how you know, on the one hand, there's all of this activism to um, protect the coral reefs that are, are being decimated, um, protecting mangroves and local habitats. But also there's such uh, an emphasis on having like a clean lawn and pristine space uh, as a part of sort of like to represent domestic prosperity, you know. So for this project, I really wanted to turn the landscape inside out and bring uh, grass, that clean lawn, to the interior of the space. And then I, I built these uh, six foot by nine foot uh, reliefs with all of these plant clippings from people that they left out on the street, you know, from their yards and that sort of thing. Um, so uh, I guess to answer your question, that's sort of how the work has developed over the years. It, it started off as very ecolo or archeological and it's become more and more uh, ecological and it's, it's become a primary focus and concern in my work. Absolutely. I think having an ecological focus is really important. I I don't know if I've ever shown you my work, but I, I do a lot of found objects too. Like when yeah. you mentioned going into abandoned buildings, I'm like, that is my primary like source of art material. Yeah. But uh, one thing that I really like in your work, looking at it conceptually, I see the the cement and the resin are things that are going to stay in the environment for a very long time right. and you embed plants in it which to me has this interesting conversation about 
not only what we leave in nature and what is going to outlive our civilization, but how nature affects us as well. So I, I take this very, I guess, multi-layered conceptual read on your work. When you're creating it, do you have some sort of conceptual idea with it or do you want it just open to conversation with the viewer? Absolutely. Um, you know, I, it's something I'm thinking about constantly as I'm making my work. Um, of course, you know, once it leaves the studio, it's up to anyone's interpretation. Um, but uh, in regard to what you were saying about it, um, yeah, uh, on the one hand, you know, to uh, let me move on. Um, this is some recent work where instead of um, taking leaves that would decay over time, uh, a lot of those pieces that I have in the shows um, with uh, uh, plant clippings, obviously they change over a period of time and they decay. And, and a piece like this, and let me show you a detail, um, these are all the leaves and found objects that I normally put in the sculptures that I showed you previously. Uh, I've been making rubber molds of each one of them, each leaf, each piece of rebar or chain and casting them all out of resin. Um, and then I'm embedding them uh, into these uh, wall reliefs. Um, the idea is that, you know, these leaves are this, this impermanent thing. And so here I'm taking a toxic material that is, uh, you know, terrible for the environment and preserving the likeness of these plants potentially forever. You know, I mean, uh, we all know that plastics take millennia to break down. Um, so there is, you know, a little bit of an ethical pivot there, but um, I could talk more about that, but I might end up ranting if I, if I get to <laughs> the weeds. Um, so uh, this is a piece that's in uh, the show, uh, Rewilding Structures, and this piece as well. So um, yeah, but, but essentially it's, it's, the, it's the same objects and plants that I would normally collect. But now I'm taking um, taking them and, and trying to preserve their likeness. Uh, almost like a a dark echo of their by by creating art out of them, you are diminishing them almost in a way by creating them into something that will never decay and yet elevating them into art. Right, and you know, I think about it in, in sort of the, uh, like a German romantic landscape painter, you know, I mean, I do think about this sort of like, this romance that we have with nature and the sublime, you know? And one of the concerns that I have now is that nature was always presented as this thing, like in uh, romantic landscape painting that um, would inspire awe and that we as individuals can measure ourselves and our limitations against. Um, but nowadays, you know, we've, we've won the battle against nature. You know, we have like, we've taken over. And so that element of the sublime, I, I think uh, can't be found as readily in nature as it once was. And now it's in, you know, the endless frontier of the internet in virtual worlds and consumerist culture, um, that's what inspires awe. And so I think uh, to scroll back, using these plastics, this sort of new plastic landscape that we're living in, uh, that's what the work is, is about. I really like this one that you have on the screen right there. That's beautiful. Thank you. Is, um, that, is that a, like a block of butter at the bottom of it? It's actually, it's bronze. Um, uh, oh, this is, ties into Kylie's. Yeah, so uh, some recent work that I've been doing are these uh, steel armatures that look like you know branches or leaves, and it's a way of combining uh, the real object, you know, real plant life, real found objects, and things that I make as well, and 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 blending those two things, and and you know, basically having the the work that has living plants and and uh, plastic or recreated plants um, all together in one in one object. 
I'm kind of curious now. Do you have any pictures of your work after it's decayed? Uh, I not readily available, so uh, it might not be worth trying for me to try to like dig them out of all my files. I guess you'll have to if you ever run into them, you'll have to send them to me. I, I think that decay and entropy are. Abs I think that's the sublime now is that that with overpopulation and the environmental effects of it's not even overpopulation it's over consumerism and the effects of that I think that decay and entropy have are even more romantic and sublime to me so I think I would like to see like your artwork as as a letter to a, a love letter to decay yeah absolutely um I, I don't know uh, how are we doing on time. Am I eating all of it up? Oh, I, oh we got a little bit left. I'm um, so. Uh, well, I guess we'll close up real quick with you. Um, do you consider yourself an environmental artist? I'm gonna say probably yes based on this, but I will let you answer. I do definitely. Um, you know, um, I obviously uh, I use a lot of you know found materials and resin and things that aren't necessarily sustainable, but. Um, the the message and and what I'm trying to uh, inspire in people is definitely uh, an ecological message. Um, you know, in terms of like my use of resin, I know that, that is a toxic material. Um, but I think one of the things that that speaks to is that uh, so often in our society, the onus gets put on us as individuals. You know, like campaigns like not using straws or single use plastics, that sort of thing. But really. Um, those efforts are just a drop in the bucket compared to um, policy changes that could be enacted by the government. Um, the United States uh, military, for instance, produces like 40% of carbon emissions uh, produced by the United States. So that's the kind of policy change that needs to happen to really affect uh, um, uh, our, our climate crisis. Um, so anyway, I'll, I'll leave it with that. And I think that the the fact that you use resin, though, I think plastic and resin is only really not to say it's like, oh, everybody go out and use resin. But I think a you're starting a conversation about the environment with your work and b your work is beautiful. So it's not like it's going to get thrown out into the ocean and have a little turtle choke on it. So. <laughs> oh, thank you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Hopefully, I don't know. I don't, maybe they're going to dig out a turtle and they'll be like, oh no, Jack Henry, killing maybe. turtles. Maybe. Hope. <laughs> Hopefully not. I my fingers crossed. Thank you for talking with us, Jack. Thank you very Pleasure much. Pleasure as ever. Thanks, so, thanks to everyone who tuned in. Thanks, Jack, very much. Appreciate it. Um, we are going to finish up the panel today uh, discussing the artwork of Kylie White. And as we mentioned at the beginning, um, Kylie is not feeling well today. So we do wish her the best and we hope that she feels better soon. Uh, she is represented, though, uh, by uh, Adam Moskowitz from Moskowitz Bays, the gallery here in Los Angeles. Uh, Kylie makes sculpture that explores time, scale, observation, and our position on Earth relative to that within our universe. Her recent body of work titled Six Significant Landscapes, which was shown at the Gallery Moskowitz Space in Los Angeles in 2019, brought together six works that function at once as sculptures, scale models, geologic diagrams, and proposals, each depicts an active fault line in a place of displaced terrain due to tectonic movement in California. She has exhibited her work internationally and currently lives and works in San Francisco. Um, I had an opportunity to read her essay beside myself and I was fascinated by that juxtaposition of geology and art. And so hopefully Adam, you'll be able to touch a little bit on that today. Um, so with that, I would like to introduce um, Adam Moskowitz, who is himself an artist and partner of the gallery Moskowitz Space, which represents Car Kylie. Uh, he lives and works in Los Angeles. And so welcome again, Adam. And I am going to pin you. There you go. Hi. How are you? 
I'm good. Good. Thank you for that lovely introduction. Uh, absolutely. It's great to have you here. I'm going to go, well, um, while Hope gets started, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen so that we can get um, Kylie's work up for everyone to see. Wonderful. Thanks for joining us today, Adam. My so, pleasure. I absolutely am in love with Kylie's work. Um, so I, I started out in the art industry at Fine Art Solutions, and we used to frame Kylie's watercolors and her watercolors are even incredible i don't know if you want to touch on if we have sure. time for you to touch on watercolors but they're just heartbreakingly yeah. romantic yeah i mean it's it's all it's all part of the 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 same practice i mean it's a, it's actually a good place to start in a weird way because those watercolors are about observation and all of her work is about observing the landscape and using the landscape as a kind of tool, um, a meditative tool to position um, our own insignificance within the broader scheme of things. Um, the, the work you're looking at now, which is, it's perfect, you can see it uh, wonderfully, is okay. uh, as she said from the show, six, six Significant Landscapes, which title comes from a Wall Stevens poem of that same title, wonderful, uh, wonderful vision of a, of a poem and one of Kylie's favorite poets. Um, this show uh, really came together as a result of a long meditation on uh, geology and how uh, she could make artwork from it. Uh, the one thing that is not really mentioned in that introduction, um, but should be touched upon is that it's kind of a cross reference and a cross breed. You'll see some um, Eastern influences in the way these bases are made. And even the, the idea of elevating a stone, uh, there's a very um, rich tradition uh, of, of uh, what are called gazing stones uh, that um, in ancient China, um, these they're called scholar rocks and they would find rocks, um, philosophers and scholars would, would, would find rocks that were very uh, specifically sculpted, if you will, by the landscape, carved by wind, carved by water, and they would put them on these really elaborate plinths. And the idea was that you would meditate yourself into that landscape just by looking at the stone. And this idea really captivated Kylie. Um, and she, she kind of took it and ran with it as it relates to thinking about meditating yourself into a much think of it like a scale model you know all, all of these rocks that you're looking at refer very specifically to places um fault lines in california uh, the one closest to us um on this more square base is the garlock fault um which is in the middle of california and the one that's low is um is actually the yep that one <laughs> uh that's the owens that represents the owens valley uh so and, and how the Sierra Nevada mountains are slipping away from the Owens Valley, that each one of these stones um, are uh, mined from the place that, they, that the fault line is made out of or close to. I'll explain later why close to. Um, but the, the Owens Valley one, the low one, that long, long, low piece of stone is, a, it's called lava, it's made out of lava tuff which is uh, ash that has been condensed and condensed and condensed with stone aggregate um, until it becomes a solid. And that's actually what the Owens Valley uh, is made out of. That's why it's so fertile. That's why we love our Central Valley for all of its agriculture that it produces. Um, but it is a very soft, uh, if you can imagine, because of the process that it was made, it's a very soft sediment. It's very nutrient rich, but, but soft. And the Sierra Nevadas, which, is the left rock um, are made out of almost solid granite. And those were carved by glaciers over uh, millions and millions of years. So the, the combination of a hard rock and a soft stone and the fault line that cuts through it, basically is, it's called a normal fault. And, and the Owens Valley is slowly slipping away from the Sierra Nevadas. And um, there's little kind of cues everywhere to give you a sense of scale, um, but if you can think of yourself as like the most tiny, tiny, tiny little person floating on one of the, or the sitting on one of these, on one of these rocks, 
um, you can kind of get the idea of the kind of magnitude that she's she's talking about. And of course, whenever you even, I love the idea of even elevating a, a rock on a pedestal, you don't think about it, but um, because we are, we are so consumed by, you know, just the, the every day, but a rock, I mean, one of these rocks is tens of millions of years old. It's been around for a long, long time and has gone through many, many metamorphoses and um, it's, uh, chemical components have changed, its physical makeup has changed. And even that action should stipulate, should, should kind of provoke or evoke uh, a kind of um, deep thought about time in general, about how really we've just been here for no time at all. Um, and the, I can get into the specifics of what these faults are doing, like I did with the Owens Valley, but they're, um, they're kind of stylized in a way and wherever you see bronze typically is uh, something that she is colloquially refers to as earth fasteners. Um, it was, it is an idea of a kind of intervention in the landscape, if you will, if these were actually cut and inserted in the landscape in steel, what would happen is over time, the fault line would just rip apart or mangle the steel in a very specific way based on what the fault line does. And for Kylie as a, again, another thought experiment, I mean, should these ever be erected, they would be, you know, uh, hundreds of feet long. <laughs> it would be a lot of work, but what you would get to see and almost from a scientific perspective as well as artistic is how, well, the scientific perspective is how far everything's moved and why it's moved. But the artistic perspective is that, it's to laugh at man's folly, if you will. The idea of fastening the earth together or of taking a piece of steel and trying to insert it over a fault line like you were gonna hold the earth together. Um, of course you can't and the steel would be nothing compared to the force that the earth would just completely wreck it with. So there, there's this dual meaning behind the bronze pieces that are in here that are so meticulously worked in. If you wanna go to the next slide kind of work through here um yeah go to the next one maybe we'll see if we can there you go so you see how that actually is very it's a, on a curve um and the garlock fault this being the garlock fault um is on a nice beautiful great little what'd you say it said the garlock fault such a great name it sounds something like out of like uh what's that lord of the rings you have to call totally it totally the, yeah the garlock fault exactly and it, it's a very it's a very weird one actually the the there was a pretty big quake that came out of it maybe i don't know, i want to say a year ago now um and, and uh kylie was of course obsessed and wanted to go drive out there and see how everything had moved um but the the curvature uh is actually it's exaggerated here um, for effect, but it, it, it does it does compress as a fault line. Um, and that's because the San Andreas fault cuts over it, um, cuts around it, and the San Andreas fault is much bigger than the Garlock fault, and it is forcing it to compress on itself. So every now and again, that kind of S shape tries to correct itself. It tries to be spring back to being straight, and the, and the San Andreas fault snaps it back to being bent. So you get obviously a lot of tectonic movement. Um, and so it's this very active, very kind of mysterious uh, fault that a lot of scientists are studying. And one of my favorite things about Kylie's work um, is just the meticulous attention to detail that she pays. This kind of granite is called diorite. And you can see that it has a slope and a contour up a mountain. In fact, it is almost identical to the topography of where the Garlock Fault is, which is a really long, slopey, gentle plain um, in the middle of California. And you can even see the base that it's sitting on is, um, it's, it's steel, but she's cut the steel to be almost exactly the profile of the rock. And that's, um, uh, that's also a, a direct uh, allusion to um scholar rocks that was a very common thing that uh that they would do for scholar rocks which would to accentuate the kind of beauty of the natural rock itself um so very minimal cuts here um you know this was a boulder that she was looking for and looking for and looking for until it, it she saw the topography that she wanted and then just made that 
that curve cut, which was definitely not an easy cut to make in solid granite, um, and cut the hard edge on the right side. Um, and that that is it. The rest is just the rock that um, obviously gets uh, sealed and, and whatnot. But the, the bronze uh, is hand polished like crazy. Um, and she, so the, the materials are, are, are basically kind of speaking for themselves. That's very, very much Kylie. You go to the next so, slide. Yeah, go ahead. Quick question about the bronze. I noticed that it's hanging off the table a little bit. Is yeah. that an aesthetic choice or is there some sort of conceptual reasoning behind that as well? It's, it's, it's purely aesthetic. I think that the, that she wanted to create, I mean, if you look at it from a different angle, maybe go to the next one, I think you might be able to see it better. Yeah, kind of not really. But when you when you there was there was a point in, in this piece where when you were walking around it, it would kind of mirror the the bronze is so highly polished that it would mirror um, almost perfectly the other side of the of the rock, if that makes sense. And, and giving a little bit more bronze on the edge there get, gave that mirror effect a lot more of a, of a, of a pop. Um, and I, again, it's part of that just general kind of sensitivity to material. I think all those little choices uh, um, that you just picked up on Hope, you know, another one would be those little cutouts and all the legs, um, you know, that she's she's flame cutting. Uh, she's also a, an amazing welder. She she would she would call herself a mostly steel welding sculpture sculptor. The stone for her was was really reaching out of her comfort zone because uh, she's comfortable with a welding torch. Um, and so the bases, you know, it's funny even calling them bases. They kind of, it, it, it sounds almost secondary, but to her, it's very much a part of the sculpture. Um, it's almost as important as the sculpture itself. In fact, a large kind of very poetic meaning and idea in this show that she talked about was that um, that everything is, is, is a pedestal. So, um, the the steel is of course a pedestal for the rocks, but the concrete is a pedestal for the building, which is a pedestal for the bases, which is a pedestal for the rocks. And the concrete of the building is sitting on the earth's crust, which of course is a pedestal for all of us and a pedestal for the concrete and a pedestal for the steel, which is a pedestal for the stone. So the, you know, the deeper you go, it kind of, it kind of, it, the this the pedestal or the or the the bases are the the rooting structure if you will they're they're really really fundamental to her in terms of the metaphor for how these things work and you'll notice the different heights of them um these are all based on just kind of uh, aesthetic visual formal principles that she has has been um working with for a, a long time in in her uh sculpt sculpting career go to the next slide Oh, sorry. Hold on. There you go. It's all good. Oh yeah, there's a great view of of um, of this piece, which you can see that those cutouts now is is just whew, it, they're they're something else. So this is um, you can see there's two different types of stone here again, and then that fault line that cuts it in between, and that triangular piece of bronze on the top, which of course is the earth fastener. Um, this this fault line. Um, this stone on the right is much, much older and much denser than the stone on the left. And it actually is, uh, the stone on the left is subducting underneath the stone on the right. Um, and the idea is that as it subducts, this earth fastener would be pushed out of the earth further and further and further um, because it has, it's anchored to the rocks. That makes sense? <laughs> so this piece here? Yeah. Yeah, okay. the, I mean, this is in theory it would it would move um, if it was installed in the landscape. But again, the, all these things are kind of meditations on putting yourself in that mindscape. And this is the uh, San Gorgonio, um, which is very close to Los Angeles. Actually, it's the San Gorgonio uh, fault line. We'll go to the next one. There it is again. Nice piece of granite. That's beautiful. With the striations yeah. in it. Yeah, that's totally, totally beautiful. Oh, that's a nice detail. That's juicy. Mm -hmm. <laughs> when I look at Kylie's work, I, I think a lot about deep time 
and just how tiny we are. I'm assuming that's something that she was intentionally was doing when she was creating this work is that she's trying to contemplate where we stand in relation to Earth and its history. Hugely important to her. Uh, she actually curated a show at the gallery um, called Deep Time uh, <laughs> and wrote an essay about Deep Time. Uh, there's a great uh, 15th century author who I'm going to blank on uh, that she read this piece by uh, and it's this lovely conversation. It's, it's called the conversation between an Iceland, a Icelander and God or something like that. And the story is that this guy in Iceland is wandering around alone, um, you know, and he's 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 basically been forsaken you know he doesn't he's like he starts he starts just why have you forsaken me guys start trying to have a conversation with nature he's trying to talk to the ice he's trying to talk to the mountains and he's trying to ask the mountains like like what what are you like why have you left me here to die why am i here alone um and you know uh, all of a sudden the mountain talks back and and uh it's it's much more beautifully written than this but this is the story and the mountain says you know you silly human i don't even know you exist and it's you know which is just to say uh nature doesn't care if we live or die and that is very much a big part of kylie's work um of course it's, it sounds rather bleak but to her i think it's an uplifting idea she sees it as a um there, it's kind of comforting in a way to know that, I mean, despite all of the ails that we can pummel on the earth, no matter what, the uh, earth has the ultimate, uh, the ultimate say. So, it, you know, it, it might turn to fire and ash again because of at our hands, um, but ultimately, it will true itself and will be gone. So that's like a. Um, kind of a sick way of looking at it. And it doesn't mean that we should go and just pollute our earth. She's very much uh, conscious of that and cares obviously deeply to preserve our earth as much as possible. But it, it, it does provide some weird sense of comfort just to put things in perspective. And all of this work is about uh, putting things into perspective. It's about thinking very deeply about how you can insert yourself into the landscape and thinking about yourself in context with it on a much, much broader scale. You want to go to the next Absolutely. frame? I'd... Oh, yeah. Yep, next one. What were you going to say, Hope? I, I was going to say that I think that that concentration on deep time is kind of at the core of the sublime that things that give us that sort of feeling make us feel small. Yeah, yeah, totally. Um, and it's, it's a great compliment to Kylie's work. Her work makes me feel tiny. Feel what? Tiny? Yeah. 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 It, it, I mean, even, even, the, even that's, it's so funny, you know, this, this rock on the left is 900 pounds and it's, it doesn't feel, it, she makes it feel so light in the sculpture, but it's so ridiculous to install these things to think like, <laughs> you know, but to, but while you're doing it, all you can think is like, this is one tiny boulder you know in the in in the scheme of 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 millions and millions and millions of of other boulders um that are much larger and much more imposing and it just it's unfathomable you know it's like trying to it's like trying to think of distances on an astronaut uh, astronomical level you know there's a point where your brain just stops to compute um <laughs> and 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 her work really helps you get there <laughs> We'll go to the next frame. We can see some of the works in the, this will, next one, we'll get to the works that are in, there you go. Right. So these um, pieces represent the San Andreas Fault and the one in the back um, is actually the one that was um, in the Rewilding Structures show. Um, and the green stone um, is called, uh, it's called Green Schist and comes from the Yuba River, which is, uh, slightly north California and it it is actually so like I said this these two are meant to represent the San Andreas Fault and the reason why there are two is because the San Andreas Fault is very long um, and there needed to be some sort of 
kind of idea of the continuation of what that fault would be. So if you can imagine, and this is a really great view to think about this, the, the boulder in the back and the boulder in the front are actually from the same boulder. It was just cut, like sliced, um, almost butterfly. And the boulder in the back can sit perfectly on top of the boulder in the front. And, um, and then it was cut in half. So, and then offset, because the San Andreas fault is, a, is, is moving uh, laterally. It's slipping across itself. Um, and the, 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 the green rock originally was supposed to be a stone called serpentinite, which is very, very common. Um, it's the, it is the bedrock of most of the San Andreas fault. Unfortunately, serpentinite is full of veins that are um, asbestos. So what oh, happens when you, not, yeah, what happens, <laughs> what happens when you cut serpentinite is that all of this asbestos uh, goes into the air and in your nose and in your eyes and on your skin and it's not good. Um, so the, she made a little tiny model out of serpentinite that she actually mined herself. And then once she found out what was the, what the white veins were, she realized that was not gonna work for the larger ones. Um, <laughs> And so she had to find a kind of alternative, which is this green, green schist, which doesn't have any asbestos in it. But the interesting part about serpentinite and that being the stone for the San Andreas Fault is that the San Andreas Fault is known as a slippery fault. And it's slippery. This is just so fantastic. Um, the reason why it's slipping is because uh, asbestos, dry asbestos, when ground down, um, which it is gr constantly grinding as stone scrapes across it becomes a dry lubricant and it is actually lubricating the fault. So it's lubricating the rock above it. So it is literally slipping. It's a, it's literally slippery because of the asbestos. So you've got this rock kind of sliding around because it has this dry lubricant down there. Um, and that, that's like a, I mean, it's just a wonderful, uh, it's wonderful when science sometimes is just kind of like right there in front of you and it's just so stupidly simple. Um, it's like, of course it's slip, it's sliding. It's cause it's on a slippery thing. Um, and so that was what the green rock is supposed to, that's what the green rock represents here. And you can see they have two different types of earth fasteners here. The one that's flat, which you can't really see maybe in a subsequent shot, you go to the next frame, maybe we'll see it. I don't really know. Oh, yeah, there you go. There's, see, there's two dovetails um, that are carved in bronze uh, and then inserted uh, into it. And you can, see, this one is the most uh, kind of wonderful to think about conceptually. If, if you were to create this um, outside and you can think of those dovetails as maybe being um, 60 to 100 feet long and spanning a, the San Andreas Fault, in steel, in hardened steel, you bury them into the ground. And so they're flat, flush to the ground. And then over time, the earth is going to pull and rip those dovetails apart as it slips. Um, and thinking about, you know, it would have, it would take millions of years uh, for the steel to actually, you know, move in a very, in a very noticeable way. Um, but it's, it's, it's just a wonderful uh, thought experiment to think about how cool these would be as earthworks. Um, and this one in particular, I think, is, is, is still like kind of on the docket for her to propose as an earthwork. And go to the next one. Maybe we can see the, uh, oh, there's a nice dovetail detail. You can, there we go. So, and this was the one in the, in the show. And, and this one has this beautiful rod of bronze that cuts through the entire thing um, at, an, at, a, at a pretty crazy angle. Um, and the, the idea behind this one is that, of course, if this was drilled through, uh, it becomes like a tunnel and you could walk into and see the fault line from the inside of the mountain. But also over time, of course, this rod cannot hold the earth together and it would be pulled apart. Um, and that those are that that was the those are the six significant landscapes. <laughs> Great. Absolutely beautiful. Thank you for sharing that with us, Adam. My pleasure. And and I guess I don't know if anybody's still there, 
but if we can do a Q and A still, if anybody's interested, yeah, I know we, we went a little over. That's, that's great okay. conversations with all of you. We still have um, about 14 or so folks that are, including ourselves, that are on. Um, we did get a very nice note. I'm gonna, hold on one second. I'm gonna see if I can get folks to unmute uh, for anyone who wants to ask a question. But yeah, we have about 14 folks on. Um, we had a comment in the chat. This is a beautifully curated ex exhibit. Um, original and thought-provoking. Congratulations to all. So that was very sweet. Thank you to whoever that was. That was My from, mom, probably. <laughs> oh, that was from Samuel. So um, that's the other thing I wanted to do is, sorry, I am going to put um, the uh, Moskowitz Bays.com into the chat as well as Kylie's um, page on that so that if folks want to go ahead and there we go if folks want to go ahead and you guys can probably see the chat too but um thank you so much we really weren't um this is kind of our our first foray if you will into uh trying to show uh for our members and for those who want to be members uh without being able to go into the art museum, uh, what's happening there. And so we would love to have more of these. We have some coming up in February. Uh, they are gonna be artist-based. Uh, we're getting all of the marketing together for those, but uh, we're gonna have four uh, Fridays in February where we, um, as a board, selected uh, four artists and uh, we are going to do some background on them. But really the idea there is that, uh, so like the first artist is Mark Rothko. You may not be a Rothko fan, but we want you to tune in so that you can learn a little bit more about his work. Um, there's a lot of misconception out there about uh, contemporary artists and contemporary abstract artists. And so um, our goal this year is really just to immerse everybody in as much art as we can and to the gallerists, to Adam and uh, Marina, we're, we're really, really hoping to get um, some uh, Tama talks together this year in 2021 to talk about uh, galleries and how they're different than museums and, and how you select your artists. And we want to talk to Hope about that, too. And I don't know. We still have a few folks on there. I'm not sure if you can um, share with us what the registrar of the Torrance Art Museum does. Oh, uh, yeah, sure. It's, uh, I do administrative and logistics for the museum. I think curation is a lot more exciting, although the registrar is a very essential job. So I, the place would fall apart without me. <laughs> I like Adam nodding his head vigorously. <laughs> <laughs> I am sure that that's true. And then I guess uh, the other question I would have is that idea that um, uh, how do you move from being the registrar to curating your own show and, uh, you know, the, di the what's required in being a curator versus just being, an, not just being, but being an artist versus being a curator? So I, I think as a curator, I think there is a high level of artistry involved that I'm the concept that I'm trying to express. I'm, I'm not necessarily using my own materials, but my materials are other people's work. So I'm creating a conversation and an idea and a concept using the work of other people to influence and create thoughts of what I'm doing and what I'm trying to express. So I'm taking other people's work that it's almost like when you're writing a research paper and instead of using quotes, I'm using other people's artwork as my reinforcement, like, hey, this artist created this work, which has this concept that bolsters my concept as a whole. Nice. So that's where the curation. Uh, Marina, Adam probably have their own ideas of it as well. I think everybody, uh, it's, it's a, such a subjective question and concept. 
Well, feel free to chime in. Um, I have made it so that you can unmute and um, post your video. So we have uh, maybe a minute or so, if any, or longer if people have questions, but I don't see any questions coming over the chat or hands raised or anything. So we thank you all so very much for participating. Um, it's really been a pleasure. And uh, we hope to uh, have more of these over the next uh, several months, particularly when we can't get out to galleries and we can't get into uh, museums. It's crazy here in Florida, and uh, I'm sure it's crazy in California. Um, and so uh, thank you so very, very much. We really appreciate it. Thank you guys very much. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thanks for watching. Thanks for joining us. Stay safe. And hopefully we can all go to museums soon. Yeah. Thanks, Hope. Bye-bye.